Thank you. Kalinic Level Underwriters Laboratories representing the National Association of State Bar Marshals. Quick Porter also representing NAPSA. He's for the Global Fire Protection Group, ICC. Mark Wassum, uh, LA Kansas Fire Department, um, representing the ICC. Carl Clippinger, Vice President of Fire and Disaster Mitigation, representing ICC staff in the Government Relations Department out of the Washington, D.C. office. And I just remind folks that as you're speaking today, if you could just kind of speak up a little bit more, maybe in your instructor voice, just because the mic is kind of over here and you can see the uh, on the mute button over there, you get a good idea of how the, the voice level is carrying um, on the microphone. So the folks that are online will be able to hear you as well. Christy Reed, Kansas County Fire Department, uh, representing the AP. John Lane, General of the Kansas Fire Department. Uh, Jim Deal, uh, Howard Hill, representing ICC. Russell Gregory. Christopher Frazier, Kansas County Fire Department. John W. Bill, City of Bill, Chief Board of Trustees. Ben Spears, South Bend with the Downey Fire Authority. Dave Mander, that's it. Keith Eppler, United States Fire Administration. Shaneen Rashid Sumar, National Marine Science Association. Jeff Hill, Melville Fire District, St. Louis. Thank you. I'd like to um, ask Carl, can you go through the boxes for those of yep. you that are um, sure well. today? Sure. I've got um, one number that's coming in with the last two digits of. Five eight. Could you um, just announce who you are? Oh, this is William Hyde representing IAFC Southwest. And could I echo your comment? Um, if people could use their instructor voice, it's difficult to hear. Gotcha. Yeah, and I'll make sure that when we're talking about stuff, Chief, that we'll uh, we'll make sure that we kind of repeat it for the group here. Um, we're kind of spread out a little bit due to the COVID restrictions in the room as well. As I, maybe you can see, I, I don't know if you're logged on online, but um, we are kind of spread out. And as we get into some of the more substantive things, I'll make sure that I repeat them for the folks that are online as well, if that works for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yep, very good. Um, Dale, could you introduce yourself again one more time for the folks that just joined us? Okay, Chief West. Yes, this is Gary West. I represent the National Association of State Fire Marshals. Good to have you this morning. Uh, Proud, proudly wearing my my ICC shirt. Very good. Totally. Marshal DeRochers. Michael, you're on mute. On mute, Michael. Yep. Hey, sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, Mike DeRocher, uh, State Fire Marshal for the state of Vermont. And I am the group leader for emerging issues and trends. And I'm going to echo what Gary said. I'm proudly have my ICC shirt on. Rick Boisbert, Marshal Boisbert, you there? Yes, sir. Uh, Rick Boisbert, uh, Brighton Area Fire Authority, Brighton, Michigan. Uh, representing the Great Lakes Division of the IAFC. Great. How's everybody doing there on your end? You guys okay? Yep, everybody's doing all right. So far, nobody else is sick. Rick was going to be able to join us, but he had, uh, was it your son that, that came home? So I guess the, everybody's grounded for a little while while they make sure every, everyone's uh, either on the mend and, and also not getting sick. So he did not want to come here and uh, subject anybody else potentially to infection. So thanks for doing that and still joining us from home in Michigan. Absolutely. Robbie Dawson with the NFPA, how are you? Hey, good morning, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Sorry I'm not there now, but I'll see you all on Tuesday. I'll be up for the hearings. Good to see everybody this morning. Awesome, thanks for joining us. Rock, 
Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Rock Meng. Uh, I'm the liaison for the uh, Global Membership Committee. Thanks for joining us, as you always do. I believe that's it. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, Gabe, I know you, you might have to move on. Do you have a couple moments maybe to say a, a few words to the group um, before we get started, if you like? I, I'll do a quick introduction, if, if you want. So. Gabe Mazur is, is uh, my colleague currently uh, serving in, he's Deputy uh, Senior Vice President of Government Relations. Um, he uh, currently works our federal portfolio, um, but uh, as you have all heard, and as we've announced, uh, our boss, Sarah Yerkes, is planning to retire after a long career at both the ICC and the NFPA previous to that. Um, Gabe will be um, taking over for Sarah when she retires on December 31st. So uh, beginning of the year, Gabe will take over as our, our new leader of the government relations uh, team. And he just wanted to come in and say a quick hello to the group this morning and uh, introduce himself so that you all got an idea of who he was and he'll be the name that you hear moving forward after the first of the year. So, Gabe? Um, I know how important the fire service has been for, for Sarah. I want to make sure that we continue to the piece. So be sure to give Carl and get what they need to support the department. Very much looking forward to working with you all to come to the district. And just spending some more time in this first of all we're here. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. All right. We'll go to uh, item number two for opening remarks from the chair. Um, so you'll notice that our chair, Randy Metz, is not in attendance today. Um, you probably have also seen that he, his picture is up throughout the area. Um, he is uh, an ICC board candidate, so he's busy doing uh, a lot of candidate uh, responsibilities today. So we won't miss him here, but um, so see. Um, and if you're I think I saw Steve drawing a mustache on him. Yeah. <laughs> if he hasn't yet, it will come. Yeah. Um, but but Randy did. Um, he is sorry to miss um, everyone at this meeting. Um, he did prepare um, some comments that I'd like to read to you. He sent me an email, so if you'll indulge me as I read. Uh, impossible. I just want to make sure everybody, uh, every everyone that's uh, on. Maybe I'll just ask Gary and Michael since I see your cameras. Can you hear Christine okay? No? Well, Christine, I would suggest either I can okay, move a little bit or maybe you can scoot down too. It's up to you. Where's, where's the mic? Right here. Awesome. Christine just moved down a little bit for us, so. You should be able to hear a little bit better. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, if you didn't hear before, this is a, a statement from Randy since he wasn't able to attend today. Uh, <clears throat> again, this is from Randy. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all, both governing committee members and FSMC members for all of your hard work and support over the past two years. It has been difficult for many of us, both professionally and personally since last year, but somehow we have all made it back to see each other again in person. We have managed to make progress on many of our initiatives during this time, and I'm happy to see us all get back to work on furthering the message of community risk reduction and educating the members of ICC on fire service issues and concerns. Many thanks to our work group chairs who have stepped up to provide leadership and to those who have participated in supporting these work groups. This is where the real work is performed, and I thank you all for your contribution. Special thanks go to Carl, Tim, Christine Reed, and Bill Bryant for their weekly conference calls, input, advice, guidance, so that we can keep the fire service at the forefront of the ICC organization. My apologies that I'm not able to join you all in person this morning, but I hope to make it over to the meeting if I get out of the nominating committee exercise early enough to make it over to the hall. If not, I hope that we can connect sometime today at one of the other events or at the ABM tomorrow. I'm looking forward to another outstanding year in 2022, and I know that this great group of professionals will accomplish great things for our fire service membership. 
So that again is from Randy. So moving on uh, to 2A, um, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Seeing none. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Carl sent out minutes to our um, last meeting in August. Um, looking for a motion to approve. Second. Great. Chair first, Kelly second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great, thank you. So uh, minutes pass. Uh, all right, going down to item three, uh, 20. Twenty. Oh, I was gonna say, is that true? No, it is not. Okay. <laughs> it would be read from that. So I thought I caught all of those. Um, okay, so we are down to the work group updates. Um, so for um, our guests in the room, four work groups within the uh, Fire Service Membership Council: uh, training and education, membership, public awareness, and emerging issues and trends. So these are. Um, just as the chair said in his email, this is where the work happens at the FSMC. So um, if you are ever attending at any of our meetings that we have every month um, through WebEx, um, you are welcome to participate in any of these work groups. Uh, we produce a lot um, and we have many goals that we achieve every year. So we're, we're especially thank you, thankful for all of the participation of the work groups. Uh, at every meeting, we do ask the work groups to give us uh, an update. So with that, I will go to the first, um, which probably isn't here. The first is membership um, recruitment. Gary or Andy, I don't see Andy. Gary, do you have any comments for membership recruitment work group? Uh, yes, I'll give a little update. Um, as far as member recruitment goes, we're having monthly meetings. And at those meetings, we're discussing things that will help with recruitment to this group. And uh, I think we've, we're making a lot of progress and in particular working on programs for each uh, of our calls that are very informative and 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 keep people interested to keep people to come on and be a part of this group. So I think our membership recruitment is uh, is continuing and uh, and we're we're doing a good job with that because obviously we're getting a lot of people coming in. And many of us on the council remember the way back in time when it was difficult to get even council people to come to meetings. So I think we've come a long ways and uh, this uh, Andy's group, is, it, this group really belongs to Andy and and he welcomes anyone to come in on those calls and give suggestions or, or to help us with that committee. So uh, if you want the meeting, next meeting date, I think Carl may have that. That's all I have. Thank you, Gary. And I would just like to remind people that are um, coming to us virtually, if you can also speak up. It's a little difficult to hear. I know Carl's trying to ramp up the volume, um, but we appreciate um, you speaking um, a little bit louder as well. All right, our next work group. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, next work group, Emerging, Emerging Issues and Trends, Michael. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, as I said earlier, uh, I sure wish I was there to see everybody face to face. Um, I, I miss everybody. The the WebEx and Zoom and team are kind of getting stale after doing this for a couple years, but it's better than uh, better than nothing. Uh, last week, I hosted the National Association of State Fire Marshals conference here, and I just had too much on my plate here. Um, uh, just as a little reminder, our root, our uh, work group mission is to scan the environment to see what new issues or trends are occurring that might affect the fire service, and should the fire service membership council do anything about it. So that's kind of the mission of our work group. Um, this year, we established five major goals in 2021. These goals were established to enhance our relationship with other work groups 
virtual transparency and to find ways to solicit topics for group discussion. Our working group collaborated with other fire service membership council work groups and proven our collaboration and building positive relationships. So two of our goals that we uh, have been working on and continue to work on is um, hosting our work on the ICC Fire Service Membership Council's webpage uh, where all the different groups and members can access uh, the work we do. And I know that's an ongoing uh, initiative that we're working, that we're still working on. Um, our third major goal uh, was to design a PowerPoint program uh, that we would be able to present to the National Association of State Fire Marshals this year. So over the past couple of months, Kelly and I have been Kelly and I have been working on our on this program, and we were able to present this at the National Association of State Fire Marshal Symposium. So I want to thank Kelly for helping putting this program together, and also for uh, instructing it alongside uh, with myself. There were a number of state fire marshals in attendance. There was good engagement with the uh, fire marshals, and um, it's just a great opportunity for us to show NASM's relationship with ICC. Uh, so that was just a great, I, I thought it was a great uh, class that we instructed there. Um, so I also want to take the opportunity to thank Chair Metz, Vice Chair Reed, and Carl for joining our work group meetings. Um, I think it's pretty valuable when we have the leadership here participate in these calls. Uh, because frequently we do seek some guidance and some direction, and they're, they're always there to uh, guide us. I also appreciate the fact that the other work groups, um, it is so easy to participate in these work groups and to chime in on these calls. So the same with uh, Gary. If anybody's interested in joining our work group, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and we would certainly welcome anybody to join us and help participate in this work. So that's kind of a rundown. The past couple of months, we we're just busy uh, trying to put this uh, presentation together. Uh, and that's where we are. That's my report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Uh, okay, so next is the Public Awareness Committee. Uh, so the Public Awareness Committee has been um, lately working on the draft of the update for the FSMC webpage. And uh, we have sent a kind of a mock up in a way uh, to Carl to give to the ICC website. I don't know what to call them, website group. Marketing, marketing, marketing and communications group. So we, we submitted a request um, to the marketing and communications group as um, I, I let Christine and Randy know and Tim knows this too, our staff is uh, super committed to this conference right now and making sure that that comes off uh, as, as well as it can. So communications is, is, uh, is purely focused on this until we get back home. Um, and shortly after they get back home, we should have uh, something back to Christine and her group in terms of a mock-up to hopefully be able to take a look at and, and react to. It won't be a live page. It'll be one that's uh, kind of just a test page that's in the, in the background. Um, but we'll have that developed and ready, and um, they'll be able to comment on it shortly after we get back in early October, is my guess. So. Okay, great. Yeah. The the one thing that I want to stress again to uh, the work group, especially the group work group leads, is part of the participation that we're going to need with this update, web page update, is your input to what your work group needs. Um, your work group will have its own tab. Um, so you can format um, within it of what you may need, like Michael and his uh, forms or public awareness and our materials that we send out and training of certain courses. So think about what uh, your web page would be or your tab would be for the work group um, so that I, I can only look at it from a public awareness side as we do this mock-up, but I will be reaching out or our group will be reaching out to 
uh, all of you to see what do you need. This is this is our web page, so I want to make sure that it is uh, effective for everyone to be able to use and make it more user friendly for people visiting the web page, but uh, make it uh, effective for what you need it for. So, um, also the last is if you haven't gone to, uh, you have to drill down a little bit deep in the FSMC web page, but. Um, there are a few documents that the public awareness group has uh, produced and is on our FSMC webpage having to do with construction site fire safety and inflatable spray booths and educational information um, and awareness about the close your door campaign from well. So um, if you haven't looked again, I think you have to go into administration and Kind of click a couple of buttons. Car might be able to direct you direct you a little bit more, but uh, but you'll find it there, and that's and that's an example of why we want to update the web page so it makes it a little bit more user friendly. So could it, did I say that right? Where it's at under administration? You, you did. And what we're doing is we just parked it there for now so that we don't need to kind of edit the web page since we're moving forward with a, a new one. So when we get to the new one, what you'll see in, in terms of Christine's group the, in the public. Um, education group there, um, a public awareness group, is when you click on that tab, those documents are going to be kind of like right there front and center. Um, and what we'll do is we'll make sure that there's a good size screenshot of them in there and that kind of thing. So you can go right to those and kind of drill into them, print them off, um, you know, do whatever. There will be share and all that. So all of that will be kind of right in there underneath the, the public awareness piece. Similarly, the, uh, the spreadsheet that Michael and Kelly have been working on in their group will be kind of right underneath that emerging issues and trends tab. Um, so, you know, and so forth. So that's kind of what the plan is. Um, it'll be a lot cleaner, a lot better organized, less clunky. Uh, you'll be able to find stuff and it'll be usable. So that's, we're, we're pretty excited to do it. And again, we heard this a lot yesterday in the, the, uh, the, the subcommittee coordination group that um, Tim and I work with, Tim Deal and I work with. Um, which is the group that kind of ties all of the membership council activities together and coordinates all of that. Um, one of the things that will take place is my guess is that the building membership folks, as well as the other councils will follow our lead again and um, come on board with the changes that we're making. So we're pretty excited about that. All right, that is uh, all from public awareness <laughs> training and education. Mark. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a few updates for us, uh, like many of the groups, we didn't uh, have a ton of attendance at our meetings over the summer. Uh, everybody's busy with vacations and, and fun, I hope, but uh, just real quick, uh, some of the stuff that our uh, training and education work group tries to do is really support. Fire based your know, fire code or fire service based training and certification opportunities The the ICC does a great job with. Continuing education courses and certifications, but they can tend to be heavy on the building code side of things. So uh, we're really trying to push more of the fire code side of things. So uh, just a few items we've been involved with. Uh, Michael mentioned the, the course that he put together for uh, the state fire marshals group. Um, normally, we would be coming up with a, an educational or a, a group of courses for the ABM here that was limited this year. So we didn't push those forward, but we'll work hard on that for next year. Um, we were also supposed to teach at the National Fire Sprinkler Association here in just a couple of weeks. We had three classes lined up for that. Unfortunately, that got postponed till April, so we'll still uh, we'll still be on for teaching out there in April in Las Vegas. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention is you know not necessarily directly our group, but uh, Kara's done a great job putting together a new fire marshals. What do you call that, Kara? What you... Yeah, so coming up here, uh, I believe it's October 19th through the 22nd, Keystone, Colorado. Uh, they're going to put on a new uh, fire marshals track similar to the. Uh, the uh, association of fire chiefs officer development programs, but you know, specifically towards us fire marshal folks. So. Encourage you to look that up. That's a great conference if you haven't been to it. So, uh, otherwise, I, I will just echo the other work group chairs. We could always use new folks. Everybody's welcome, whether you're 
on the governing committee or or just a member of the public interested in what we're trying to do, we'd love to have you. Our next meeting, uh, we meet on the first Wednesdays of every month at 11 a.m. Central. So our next meeting will be on October the 6th. I think that's all I've got. Uh, just a quick reminder for Kara and for Mark. So I did, I ran into Joan this morning, Joan O'Neill, who is our chief knowledge officer. And um, I'd love to introduce you to her uh, later on today while you're both here at the conference. So when, when are you at home? I'm here till Thursday. Till Thursday? <laughs> Tuesday. Okay, so sit here tomorrow. I'll make sure that we, we get you together. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. All right, moving to item four, uh, reports from officers. Um, I don't see past president Bill Bryant in the room, and uh, we had Director Brown in the room, and I believe. Okay. Um, a report from the chair. I read that for Randy earlier. Um, I don't have a whole lot as report from vice chair other than um, as we get into kind of the heart of the meeting um, with new uh, business items and so forth. I just want to remind that this is your meeting. This is um, where the, you have the opportunity to provide your input, suggestions, questions. Um, this is the time that um, we're able to reconnect to be able to move forward, um, like Randy had mentioned as well, and continue the, the great work that we've been doing. So please don't be shy in um, speaking um, your opinion or to offer ideas. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, next from Carl, do you have anything further? Um, all I have is just welcome to the conference. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, for the first time in what seems like forever. Uh, as Michael said, I had the opportunity to join him and uh, Marshall Porter, as well as Kelly and a few others um, that are here at the National Association of State Fire Marshals last week. And um, that was the first time that I traveled since February of 2020. So um, it was, uh, was kind of all new, but familiar at the same time. So it's great to have everybody here. I'm glad we were able to, to hold it in person. Um, for those that weren't able to join, we miss you and uh, appreciate you being able to join us today. We certainly miss Randy. I've missed uh, being able to collaborate with him on this meeting uh, today, but uh, completely understanding where he is and having enjoyed the, um, the, the work all year long with Randy and Christine and Tim um, and Bill every Tuesday, just so you all know, we're at 1030 in the morning Eastern, we're all on the phone. So Randy's usually driving into work, Christine's driving into work, so she's somewhere kind of leaving home, getting into work kind of thing. And um, it's just a good solid hour of discussion to help them move this group forward and talking about some of the issues that, um, that affect the fire service uh, every day. So um, it's been a, a real pleasure to work with you all. Hope you take full advantage of the conference. Um, and, you know, Tim and I are here as well as the rest of the uh, the ICC staff to be able to um, kind of facilitate anything that you need while you're here um, and get you introduced to folks that maybe you haven't had a chance to meet um, or interact with some uh, activities and those kinds of things. So we're here, we're happy to help and just thank you for joining us today. So that's really all that I had in, in terms of updates. Okay, thank you. Yep. okay. Uh, we have no ongoing business items. So getting into new business, I'm going to go off agenda for just a quick minute. Um, we have two uh, governing committee members who unfortunately are leaving us. They're turning out um, for their participation. Uh, for their participate. Um, so I wanted to um, one is here, one is not. So I'm going over to Mr. Kelly Nicolello. Um, I know that Kelly will is maybe leaving the governing committee, but I know you are not leaving, leaving us all here. No, that's correct. Us. So on behalf of the fire service, fire service should come to us. Thank you. All of your service to us, um, all of your service to the fire service. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations, As Kelly. And then Mr. Gary West, do you see that up there? Can you see it on the screen? Yes, yes, I can. 
<laughs> awesome. Thank you, Gary. Oh, I'm. You're I don't understand. Right. Um, I wanted to make sure you saw that, Gary. I'll make sure that I get it to your house for you. Okay, thank you. And I apologize for not being there. I think that uh, during my just about my whole term, it, you know, we were in COVID, and I was just sitting here thinking about all the people that I still owe thank yous to. So. Um, just for participating and I, this has been a long process and Kelly asked me the other day if I was going to continue. And yes, I am going to continue. Not as a council member, but on the sidelines and I'm going to promote this. In every way I can, so. Thank you, Gary, and thank you again for all of your years uh, of service to the fire service membership council, everything that you've done. Um, to support the fire service throughout the years, um, we uh, would be sorely missed if you weren't participating, um, as well as Kelly participating in all of our endeavors. So thank you again. Yes, thank you. And you know uh, that that whole transition from from uh, uh, all happened during COVID. So I thought it was the right thing to do to uh, to step aside and and stay on the council and and. Let uh, our uh, secession plan continue like it, like we had planned for uh, several years. And I know y'all are carrying that forward, and and that means a lot to me. Great, thank you so much. All right, so we'll get back on the agenda um, for fire service involvement in the ICC code development process. So there, you'll see a number of parts to this. Um, so as, as Randy and I were talking when we were coming up with this agenda, we wanted to um, remind people that there is a, a, a level of participation and awareness that comes with being in the fire service within the co-development process on the national level. Um, over the past few years, we have seen a decline in participation in um, national committees, um, attendance to code hearings, testimonies uh, on behalf of proposals. Um, so we we'd like to reiterate the the need, excuse me, the the need for continued participation from those of us in the fire service and uh, associated with to be able to voice the concerns of the fire service across the country. Um, we're concerned that there is going to be a decline in um, what happens that affects the fire service when we don't have a lot enough voice. So, uh, so please keep that in mind when there are a call for committees, um, when there are proposals that uh, you feel strongly about um, through either your agency, who you're representing, to be able to be a part of these code hearings to um, to voice um, what we feel is um, the most beneficial for the fire service. So um, just a promotion or a plug, if you will, to, to be involved. Um, this is what it means to be a part of this uh, forum uh, for this type of organization, and um, it, it needs to start and continue. Um, does anyone have any comments to to that? I don't want to be the only one speaking. I I, I want to have a, an, a kind of a a roundtable discussion about do you, do you share that same idea? Do you uh, think that everything is uh, is being heard? Oh. See everybody. But um, been in a lot of different Facebook groups, dispatchers, technicians. So I'm from the sea, because you also know things from our customers. There's not enough dispatchers out there, fire marshals out there. 
There are ways that we can help what you guys need to do. Help you as part of the code. Great point. Thank you. It it shares that it's not it's not one sided. A lot of people that can participate to sharing that information. Anyone else? Yes, sir. To the, to the point there, I think um, we try to encourage, at least in Utah, patient ICC will be. Chad, I know there's going to be chapters. That's where you're going to go. Local level. Be building code chapters. Have input, especially for orders of businesses. So it's developing those relationships, know uh, quality of service, and what we can do to help code make the building safe. Our industry partners back home, it's a big difference. We always try to find areas in the code that helps. Facilitate proper buildings and not just be easy. Just as a side comment, I'm, I'm glad when we go through the agenda, you always pick up Andy because when I see King slash West, I don't know if I need to congratulate him on becoming <laughs> King or something. But. <laughs> There's a, a couple new tools coming up in this regard. So virtual inspections, which will open up the door to be probably more efficient with less people. But as we've had to deal with COVID, it's an upcoming tool. It's coming out. There's guidance on the ICC side that's put out. It's not in binding code, but NFPA about to be published with by uh, additional guidance on, on how to do that. That also opens, opens up the door to more but also assist for the market with the Of course, part of that has to do with the way the contracts are written. Authority to do certain things. But that is another way for private sector and public sector to come to the same work together. So that might Submit to the fire warrant to what things they establish. So, you know, who this their fire things that provide things of that nature. Now, I want to know who's come from our team. I would say that it depends on the state that you're in. Each state has its own rules and regulations. So in some states, they actually license those who can work on suppression systems, systems, extinguishers, and their permits are, are directed through the state bar and watch law, connected to the state. So usually in those situations, what you'll find is when they do completed work, that that contractor does not have necessarily to demand repair, they can identify things. Like that. So that's why the panel would the fire marshal's office, who can then look at that and decide which one of these items deserve a or to correct, and they put that back out. It's then up to the owner of the building in most cases to go out and either decide to use the same company in the inspection and repair, or they can go to another company themselves and hire them. He is getting the repair done. Our model followed up with follow up with that to completion, just as if they had done the inspection. But each state takes that little model, works it, and changes it for its own use, depending on where you're at 
put in the United States. Scattered per se. I'm, I'm Any other comments? Uh, I have a comment. Yes, Gary. Gary West. So uh, this problem of participation, and I couldn't hear real good. I heard something about King West there. So uh, I think it's West King or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the uh, this problem of participation is is bigger than just participating on the codes side of this. We we have a national problem of participating for inspectors and all the other other trades really. And uh, I would hope that maybe we could start an initiative or something to uh, participate in some of these. I know Colorado and some of you are there from Colorado has really worked hard to get to get uh, uh, people in in our trade of, uh, of inspections and becoming fire marshals. So I just wanted to mention that as something and maybe somebody else did and I didn't hear it, but. That's yeah, it. I think, I think part of it too is is how do we get down to the state levels and um, promote the same to the state levels uh, and then down even further. So it it, it really is a, uh, a ripple effect to what we do on a national level and, and how do we promote that in each of our areas um, to be more aware and participate more. So, um, you know, that that kind of goes into somewhat of the, this, you know, four part item is is being aware of um, what is going on in other coasts and not necessarily just isolated with uh, what is what we think is traditional to fire service needs. Um, we have a lot of things going on um, with the green code and some other things with accessibility. And there are, there are issues out there that are kind of out of the, the norm of what we would typically think would be fire service related. So, um, you know, that, that goes down again to whether on a national level or within your state level, um, how do you keep the fire service opinion at the forefront um, to be able to to affect change that is is good for the fire service? So you know the just keeping that in mind of of how do we um, whether it's if it's not necessarily ourselves how do we promote that out? Stage seven. Christine. Yes. Could I just make a comment too? I'm sorry if I, I didn't mean to interrupt anybody. Oh, no, that's fine. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so um, as stated earlier, I think um, at the national level, most of the state fire marshals are in the position where uh, they are the ones that are promulgating the rules uh, to adopt the standards, whether it's, I, whether it's ICC or, the, or NFPA. And in that rulemaking process, most states are required to go through the public hearing process. That is where you seek input and comments. Uh, at least here in Vermont, we, we have the fire service completely engaged uh, in our rulemaking process. So if there are issues or concerns that the fire service has, they have a direct uh, route to bring those to the, to the uh, authority having jurisdiction that adopts these standards. So that's one way in which we can get the fire service uh, engaged uh, at the national level, uh, because most of these fire marshals are, or at least members of NASM, they are the uh, decision makers in the rule adoption process. I think just like, and Kelly may have mentioned that, I couldn't hear that well, but I just wanted to bring that up, that having this relationship between NASM and ICC I can see some big uh, benefits of uh, promoting this type of initiative uh, in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, any other comments on participation in the national or state level? Just Which one thing, I'll, I'll grab you. I'm just looking up the state fire marshals. And
Um, one other component to this was just an awareness um, in light of the last, especially five years or so, is um, FSMC looking into um, the promotion or the consideration of how do we make um, the IW uh, UI code more into the forefront. Um, you know, the, the, the wildland fires that have happened in the western half uh, third of the country um, in the last couple of years um, have been um, critical to so many communities that are lost now. And just this um, year alone, uh, we've seen large fires in Montana and Idaho and Oregon and California and bled into Nevada. And so there's there's um, with with the way we're seeing the environment now, uh, it's something that we need to take the, the next step and, and see what is the fire services um, uh, stance and opinion on trying to get the UI code a little bit more out, and especially for state consideration for adoption uh, and, and whatever components that that might be. You know, I think states are, if they're not they already, they they know they're going to have to start looking at the WUI code and what that means for their state. So um, something to keep in mind for um, us as we move forward as FSMC to how do we, um, again, kind of go back to how do we promote codes that are uh, not of the norm uh, for the fire service, one of them, because it doesn't impact the entire country, but um, those states that, and it doesn't just impact California anymore. So uh, for those states that do get impacted on the especially western half, at least aware of what's for Kelly. So this was a subject of discussion um, within NASPO uh, somewhat. I got I got to say that you know the, the states that have significant wildland fire issues if they have not adopted GUI shame on them because the tool is out there okay and that comes that usually back to the state fire marshal who's in charge of that state they should be leading the charge and they are leading the charge of, of adopting that particular code in their states but there are other states who have a lot of really issues and maybe have not adopted it because of some of the impacts it may have on private residents, defensible space. How do I educate for that? Where do I get the money for that? And a whole number of other issues. Um, so in those states, uh, even though you may not think you have a wildland problem, if you were just to look around us right here, this beautiful spot surrounding the city, it's all woods. Who's to say something doesn't happen here right around in the Pittsburgh area or Atlanta, surrounded again by nothing but what? Woods. Um, so even though you may not be the California of the world, chances are at some point in time, you are going to have a wildland issue. To look after the fact is a mistake. You have to be forward thinking in that. And that's the point we probably need to concentrate on, on doing that because we know that Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, all have WUI components and or adopt the whole WUI code within their, their documents. It's everybody outside the edge of that that are just now starting to maybe question that, that have not taken that action. And it takes a governor who gets to be able to do it because it has impact. Sorry to say, this isn't going away. So I think this organization stemming from, from what you said, can take the lead in helping to promote movie within their states, whether it be Maryland or whether it be Pennsylvania, Vermont, any of those are candidates for, for the movie code. So, um, and then NFPA also has a, a piece of that. Uh, I don't know the really the standard number, but it's somewhat similar to movie. So it doesn't matter if you're an ICC state or an NFPA state, there are documents available to help you manage movie. So we don't have to build anything from scratch. It already exists. It has a lot of history behind it from the from the world examples of what have happened in the West. 
why would you not apply that to your state if you've got that potential? Well, and I think that's the point is that it kind of like what when we when we promote fire safety, we have to say this could happen to you. And a lot of people don't think that it can happen to that. A lot of areas may not feel that 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 potential is great enough. Um, whether it's rains that they have or you know, given conditions, that's what we need to um, promote is that it can happen to you, even in a greener or um, a higher rainfall total state, it can happen. Trying to shift that mindset that anything can happen is that can be a challenge. So how do we how do we do that within um, our messaging promotion uh, communications with with through whether it's through our 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 other partners agency partners that that we start just having that conversation where do we want to see this go? Christina, yes. it this might not be something we want to take on for our public awareness committee project we take you know a little bit more effort because we have other things we're working on but this might be a good discussion for us to have as a group see if we want to take this on yeah i think it, it i think it is an entire um fsmc to promote it, but we can certainly start that conversation. Well, I, mean, I think we can, somebody's got to start the ball rolling. Absolutely. Why not be us? And, and anybody that, that has any kind of um, thoughts or opinions or ideas for how do we do that, we're welcome to, to, to hear that. Uh, and then again, go down to your state level partners and your outside agency groups and whoever you're associated with to be able to get those feelers out because it, it you know it's sometimes we're a little bit too higher level in a way we need to get it down into um, into the weeds it, yeah <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not dry me <laughs> um that to get it down to those that are actually going to be able to affect that change too I wanted to make sure too that so Robbie Dawson wrote in uh, Robbie's with NFPA, but he brought up a good point on also in addition to the International Wildland Urban Interface Code that's published by the ICC. Uh, another resource for the fire service is, of course, the NFPA 1140 um, and also Kelly, I wanted to let you know, interestingly enough, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, has adopted in its entirety the 2015 International Wildland Urban Interface Code. Awesome. Every county and township in uh, the Commonwealth does. Now, uh, enforcement is, of course, another issue, yeah. um, but uh, that is a step in the right direction, and they did that when they did their full state adoption of the I-codes a few years back. So I, I found that to be interesting. But the, the point about um, wildland fire being... Um, uh, you know, a, a, a national level issue that affects, you know, I, I, one of the things that I opened with when I, I spoke with Congress uh, in, with my colleagues from NFPA, the Congressional Fire Services Institute on the IAFC a few weeks ago was that it is a national problem. And I led off with the 1947 fires in Maine, um, the 95 fires in uh, Long Island, um, New York. Uh, also, there was a uh, there was a, a, a fire that went on for almost a month in the Great Dismal Swamp of uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, where I live. Uh, and of course, I, I finished with the uh, the fire in Gatlinburg, Chief West, uh, which you, you may remember, and uh, made sure that I did stress that while the attention and the heavy volume of fire um, is, of course, in the western states and primarily 13 of the the western states, and there's great drought. Coy, you and I talked about that. Um, last week at NASPM, um, you, you know, in, in the western part of the United States right now, it truly is a national level issue. And we spent a lot of time making sure, to Kelly's points, that folks are educated to understand that it's not just a western states issue, um, particularly in New Orleans. So. I think that's a really great point about Pennsylvania because that's just to Kelly's point to that. And I think part of it is who who really knew about that? Is it very wide known, widely known? And that might be some of the training to bring either trainings about movie, movie standards or movie concepts. Bring that, that's gonna help promote it as well. 
um, it pays. It's important enough for a, a class training on it, then they have to Yes, just piggybacking on Kelly's comment, but um, you know, we, we don't often look at the aftermath, the uh, effects financially and otherwise. So we've been very fortunate in Utah this year having a small amount compared to years previous, but we have repeatedly sent crews out to California a couple of times. We've been in Oregon, we've been in Washington. We even sent two different uh, strike teams up to Montana. So the effects to Provo or to Utah directly are uh, states don't used to ask and negotiate prices on teams coming. And more recently in the last few years, especially after Paradise, when California calls, they pay portal to portal. So as soon as our crews leave, until they get back to the starting point, plus backfill, it's a huge financial impact to that requesting state through EMAC. But on the positive side, we have bolstered our relationships with our Department of Natural Resources with our emergency management partners and others so that we can get those requests processed quickly. But oftentimes there's extremely delayed payments. And so the local areas that are employing are sometimes waiting two and a half, two and a half years for reimbursement. So then that messes their budgets all up and everything else. This year we have experienced huge amounts of smoke uh, coming from California, thanks for sharing. It says we're getting really tired of the packs of California smokes every every day. Um, out out uh, part of that, Salt Lake was on the number one in the world for pollution. So there's a wide range of health effects in our states, even though we're not experiencing actual fire. That. So anything we could do to help encourage and do for others, even if it's not directly in our state, would be some of those are devastating at the local level, but have a wide reaching effect across the country. Just for a moment too, because I know that you'll probably be wrapping up. This is our official photographer from uh, for the ICC conference, but I also wanted to note that Joining the photographer and working today is my colleague Susan Dowdy in the back of the room. And Susan is the uh, the government relations representative for the state of California and also Nevada, correct? And then you've got PAC um, area too. So is it, is it PAC Island, some of the PAC Islands as well? But many of you have heard Susan's name and um, folks out west, particularly Christine and others, have known Susan for years and years. But I wanted to recognize her and introduce her to this group as well. Um, I'll allow you to be able to say a quick hello. So, yeah, we could in front of the screen. We've got uh, a few. We can get folks to turn their cameras on that are on uh, online. Um, we've got the photographer in the room, and we'll we can do a quick group shot in front of the screen um, with all of you if you turn your cameras on for just a moment. <laughs> and I take the glass. And Brian, Brian's on the way here. I guess we had to. We have to ask Brian how the. Uh, we have to ask him how Eric Church was last night when he got here. Front or behind? Um, probably up front, I'm thinking. Yep, to the sides or whatnot. Yep. Have to tell us if we're blocking the screen. Yeah. I know you're okay. That's great. Oh. Now, she's going to rearrange. Uh, she's going to rearrange. 
you're going to move me into the center. No, your bottom is on the video, and I don't think you <laughs> missed it. Here, I can turn the camera off. There you go. You have, to, you have to navigate your way through. I think this is on. There you go. Mics are always on. No, sorry, Emily. I was trying to get to um, boards that the other membership councils were presenting today, as well as. Uh, so for the folks online, one of our board members, Angie Weezy, who used to be um, our uh, board liaison to the membership council, actually just joined us and she's speaking from the podium here. So, yes. Um, and Bill is in nominating committee and I'm not sure that you were aware of that. Uh, so he didn't just ditch you. He has a <laughs> job to do this morning. Um, but yes, thanks for having me. I am. Uh, glad to be here today. I'm glad you're all here today. I understand that you got together with the other membership councils last night for dinner. I think that that is hugely important uh, to get to know other council members and just build that network um, of code officials that you hear you know, they're up to with the things that they're working on. And there's been a lot of effort in the past several years about the joint membership council and having some crossover and understanding what everyone's doing. Uh, but having those uh, non event events <laughs> really does solidify that. So, um, and thanks for being at conference. I know it's a strange year and we're all getting through it a little bit differently. Uh, but thank you for being here and for your time. You guys have put forth a lot of time and effort on the membership council, and I really, really want to thank you. Anyone have any questions for me? Any questions for Angie from the folks online at all? Please make sure you attend the annual business meeting. We have bylaws that need approving or disapproving, depending on your view about them, and elections. So make sure that you're on time for, and if not, actually arrive early so that you can get your voting device and not feel rushed to get into the annual business meeting. Yeah, I'll just be quiet and you guys can continue with your agenda. Thank you for stopping in. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you, Angie. I'll stay here for the rest of the time. So I wouldn't get out easily. Um, so to go back to the to the discussion prior, I think this what we've just and, and to Corey's point, that shows the ramifications that wildfires happen across the country. So um, you know, I I totally agree with the comments that have been said that it's not just uh, a wildland or wildfire, traditional wildfire state that should be uh, concerned about it. Um, but this is just great other reasons why that uh, the whole environment is impacted. So, so more to come on that. So I appreciate the discussion with that. Um, I think it's uh, something that we have. Um, some work to do, but I think we also have some research to do <laughs> to know, you know, especially with, you know, I didn't know about Pennsylvania. So, you know, kind of what states have have the WUI code um, entirety, certain chapters, things like that. So, Real quick, the ICC's got a great map identifying okay. what state has what codes, and I believe it even identifies the addition of the code that they have adopted. Okay. And that's, that's ongoing and always up to date, or appears to be. We're pretty much up to date. 
So the information is readily available to the committee. And based on that, you can kind of decide where you think on the point you're focused to those who have not adopted. Uh, unfortunately, it will not reflect those states that have adopted uh, NFPA. However, I think NFPA probably has something like that in their own tools available online. You can go ahead and, and check out the website. So, one of the things that I can share, and for the folks online, I'll see. Maybe I can actually just share this on online here too. Just give me a quick moment. I'm going to do a screen share here. Um, this Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that I have here. Um, folks online, can you see the spreadsheet that I'm sharing? Yes, sir. Got yes, it. sir. Okay. Um, let me uh, actually, I'm just going to, I'm going to move it over so folks in here can see it. Can you still see it, Michael? No. Okay. Hold on. I will get it to you. Just give me a second to work the technology here. It's hard to do when I'm working with a. Um, when I'm working with the projector and all that too. Um, here's what I'll do. I'll just bring it back over really quick and just speak to this. Or actually, here, here we go. Stop sharing. Let's do this. Do a share. Do. I'm going to show everybody. This is the adoption spreadsheet that I just got done working on here too. It's got a good. Um, That should do it. Um, as you can see, the big winners here are Montana. Koi, how should I say N-E-V-A-D-A? Montana, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Utah, and Washington. Those are all statewide adoptions of the International Wildland Urban Interface Code. Um, you can also see here that um, we've got about 125 um, adoptions throughout the country in other places. This does not include California because California is on the Chapter 7A um, provision. So, um, but this is all, all of these uh, areas that you'll see as I scroll through are folks that have, um, and that, well, I'll explain the California piece here in a second, that have um, adopted locally that we know of and have either submitted or our government relations team has spent some time. Um, looking at here recently, so it's about 125 or so jurisdictions in Alabama. You can see in Arizona, um, these are the counties and the, and the towns. What I did was I took out when you see this part here that says final without townships. There are literally 100 some odd townships in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I sorted the, the list out just so that it would make more sense. But these California listings are actually local adoptions of the WUI code in California on top of and in concert with the chapter 7A and chapter 49 and other provisions of the WUI code. So you can see there are a healthy number of jurisdictions in California that, that use it. Colorado, you can see that there are some that, that actually use it, which was a little, it was interesting to see that. That was, um, I wouldn't say quite surprising, but um, they're, they're older editions, but they were ones that it, they were good to know about Georgia. Idaho, Illinois, fair number there, Tim. Michigan, Missouri, Montana, as you can see, but in addition to Montana on the statewide, you can also see that there are local adoptions here in Great Falls, Polson, Ronan, St. Clair, and Troy. Nevada, get that one right this time. Few in Oklahoma. Those are all the jurisdictions in Pennsylvania. You can see I'm just kind of rolling through those at this point. 
South Dakota, a few handful in Tennessee. Texas, more than a few there, and that Texas is kind of a patchwork quilt of regulation, as many of you who have worked in Texas know and understand. I know Kelly lives there um, and understands that probably more than many of us. Hoy, this might be interesting for you. And then uh, jurisdiction in Roanoke, <laughs> in Roanoke, Virginia, um, which was kind of interesting, and then some in Wyoming. So uh, an interesting, um, an interesting mix, um, but you know, de definitely a much better handle than we had this time last year on on adoptions. Kelly. So one of the things that because, for instance, Colorado was up there, and that was a specific conversation that we had last week. Asked them. Uh, Colorado is an example of a very home rule type city. That has a huge impact on what you can do on a statewide basis. So, from a home rule standpoint, different communities can adopt Louie, but they don't have anything statewide that allows them to do that. They're actually in the process of exploring on how to do that and maybe potential changes in their legislature to allow them to adopt Louie on a statewide basis. But that's just one state with home rule. Um, so, that in itself has to be part of your conversation because if it's hard to, to encourage somebody, yeah, you guys at the state need to do this statewide, when in fact they may not have the ability to do it statewide based on the home rule issue. Texas is kind of that way. That's why you see so many pieces instead of just seeing Texas and Wooey because of the way the state is set up. It can't be done that way. Um, in the current uh, legislative Set up that they that they have. Colorado is. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. We do, um, but it's in the same boat. But their governor is putting pressure on the fire marshal's office to explore ways on how to do that. And they came to the national and asking for for help and and advice from the different state fire marshals. What have, what have you done? What have you done? And kind of from a collaboration standpoint, kind of identifying some some working points that they may be able to to go out. So it, it's it's not an easy subject, and and depending on how you structure your articles, you have to take home room into account. I just I just want to add to that. Um, I think Colorado is closer now than we've ever been to um, looking at something at the state level. Um, there are entities that are talking. They they did a um, fire commission, and this fire commission is supposed to put out and a working group. I know Carl is on the wildland and it talks about um, a lot of different issues. It's where they may get a funding source through the state. And it's the first time I've ever heard people pushing something at the state level. So it's it's been really hard in Colorado to even talk about it, but um, I think now with the problems that we're seeing, the governor is definitely wanting to push more of a statewide something. Yeah, but it's going to get a lot of pushback from some of the larger fire districts with not wanting that state control. So it, it's going to be interesting how this unfolds. And it, we, there had been discussions about: is it a statewide uh, regulation? Is it regional? Perhaps. Are there, is, are there coalitions that can be built or districts that can be built that might be able to adopt or it makes sense? I mean, it was most interesting to me to sit as a non Coloradan on this, uh, this WUI um, subcommittee that they have because the governor's office essentially, as Kara said, made an ask and a, uh, not really an ask, we'd be more of a task to this WUI group in Colorado to come up with options for the governor's office to consider, including definitions, um, potential ways to prepare and prevent uh, wildfire. And what's really interesting about it is that as much as the discussion is wide uh, at this point and kind of considering all things, all paths at some point lead to code standards, some level of discussion on regulation and any number of other things. So it's uh, it, ha having tuned into this and thinking about it, you know, two years ago, um, what would I have ever thought that I'd be sitting in a conversation hearing folks in Colorado talking about um, 
you know, prevention and preparedness um, for, for wildfire at that level, uh, I would have probably gotten laughed out of the room if I had said, said that a few years ago. So. Troublesome fire, um, and two fires actually joining at one point, they're taking out uh, quarries in the land of Grand Lake. And obviously, that starts to hit the pocketbook. And when that happens, the governor and a lot of others are starting to be aware of that. So, um, yeah, we do have some challenges forward, but I, but I don't think to try and to bring awareness to this and you know, keep adopting at least at the local level something together. But we're getting there. That's that's good news. <laughs> Just one more point. Uh, we have federal partners in in Bowie. How far is uh, the federal? Depending on what your your jurisdiction butts up against, whether it be national forest, BLM land, uh, forestry land, and we know that from a movie perspective, when you look to see how they operate, they have their own problems on a federal level. They don't speak the same language necessarily to each other, and the requirements are, are somewhat different. I think there's a move for us to maybe finally start to see maybe some coming together from the BLM and the United States Forestry perspective. One, on what the expectations are for those lands how they're managed, and then secondly, how they're managed from a fire perspective. Because just because of the, the contracts in place on how states also help uh, extinguish those fires, the, the payback on that and the methodology and the rates, uh, depending on if you're dealing with BLM or United States Forestry, uh, they vary, um, and their processes are different, and it becomes very cumbersome uh, to actually work with them. Uh, so I think hopefully as part of the, the overall whole problem, not just on a particular state level, but maybe at the federal level, we might see some coming together of these other agencies to streamline that somewhat, get some, con some better consensus on how they operate and then how that moves back down to the states. Uh, so to Kelly's point, um, the Code Council has been engaged. I wish. Gabe, Gabe, who you met um, uh, earlier, was here, but I can certainly speak for the both of us. We have been investing some uh, serious effort with the federal interagency, particularly our partners at the United States Fire Administration um, and the uh, uh, Forest Service, FEMA, uh, as well as outside uh, entities such as Headwaters Economics to begin talking about um, and continue conversations about how we can do things at the federal interagency level that makes sense to, you know, maybe ease some of this, um, uh, you know, the discussion that Kelly just had, but also be able to bring some of the really great cooperative agreement uh, based programs that the Forest Service has sponsored for so many years. They've done this, this great job, um, our, our opinion of developing some really great resources and programs for folks to use, but they've been done in stovepipes because they're cooperative agreements. There's no mandate to tie those together and there's not a mandate for collaboration. So we've been spending time to try and tie those programs together, particularly to do with buoy related data on the, uh, on the built environment, um, trying to move closer towards a model with NIST to develop a process for capturing either real time or near real time uh, understanding of how the built environment is uh, holding up um, based on construction and codes and standards in the communities when wildfire is occurring. So um, we are working with them to develop that process uh, and, and encourage them to do that, but working also with organizations like FSRI, the Fire Safety Research Institute at UL to potentially do some of that ground level uh, data collection um, in real time and hoping that uh, the feedback that we get on the built environment, uh, which is, you know, incredibly complex. Is it defended? Is it not? Does it have a WUI code? Does it not? Um, was there def were there defensible space provisions in place in the community? Are there active firefighting efforts happening to, you know, be defending that property at the time? Um, how much of the community is, uh, is currently involved? Um, 
in, in the fires, those kinds of things to get a better idea of what's happening in the in the built environment. And we're really working with our partners. I know um, you've been on the calls uh, as well, where we're trying to make sure that the United States Fire Administration is uh, able to take a lead role in this for the fire service as it should be. But we, you know, at the Code Council and in other places are um, right there alongside our partners uh, trying to work this problem um, to, to get that level of coordination that you're talking about, Kelly, because one of the things that just hit me the other day, I had a very good friend of mine reach out uh, who works at the national level for DOD Federal Fire, and they don't have a mechanism in place because feds paying feds is frowned upon um, to be able to deploy DOD federal firefighter assets um, that are typically the structural firefighting components on military bases throughout the country out there. There's no reimbursement mechanism available to them. They can do it at the state level, um, but they can't go like BLM land, uh, you know, those kinds of responses. Right. See, if you were to look at programs and probably the, the start program on the Fed side, when it comes to DOD would be Vandenberg Air Force Base. So um, just because they have so much wild land themselves, they actually have their own hotshot teams. Uh, they you go out into California and participate on those those levels. Now, whether that, that gets into any of the national forests, I have no clue from that standpoint or what to swallow their own costs uh, or get reimbursed. I have no idea if it's not associated with that. But uh, the DOD is a, is a great asset. Not to mention the National Guard and other things for, for airdrops and, and what. But still, and, and, and to Tanya Hoover's credit, uh, when she spoke to us last week, Though she didn't talk about it in depth, she inferred for sure that she was kind of work, helping to work that issue with the U.S. Fire Administration. And uh, so that's good to know. She's, she's our friend well, across the board. And to that end, she's from California to fire marshal. She's probably no other U.S. Fire Administrator staff person that I know of. But yeah, well, we'll be The Fire Administration is helping us with a, um, a presentation for the Vision 2020. Uh, symposium seven that's happening in February in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and um, the fire administration. I just talked with Rick Patrick while we were up there in Vermont. Um, he and I are collaborating to get a panel together, uh, a panel discussion together, a um, a model program uh, looking at uh, perhaps Austin, Texas, maybe one um, Kathy Clay's jurisdiction in um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, seeing perhaps if Chief Hawks is available from California um, to speak. Uh, so we're, we're trying to get a WUI component built into that Symposium 7 program with the fire administration in, in the lead and our close collaboration supporting that effort. So, um, so trying to get it out of front. I always pre preempt myself when I say this. Can I ask a dumb question? Dumb yes. question. All right. No, that, that's, and that's easy to answer. Oh, no, no question is dumb. Is, okay. is there a significant component for WUI attached to CCR? You're talking about C community, community risk CR, 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 yeah. Is there a significant buoy component attached to that as community risk reduction goes forward? In my mind's eye, I, I can't identify that. I think it's purely of more of a municipal yeah. point of view. The steering committee, I can tell you because I participate as uh, the ICC's wrap on the steering committee for Vision 2020. They want it to be there. The executive team, which Rick Patrick sits on. Um, the executive committee and then our broader steering committee, which Bruce Johnson and I and others sit on from from industry and other places um, recognize that it needs to be there. And there's been discussion of that. However, in practice, it's not been there because the push on CRR for so long has been, um, you know, essentially enhancing the public education and, and getting out of that mindset of fire prevention into the greater you know, community risk and understanding you know, how to do the risk assessment and then working against that assessment as to what your hazards and your risks are in your community. So you know, I think it's a natural follow through, but in practice, it's not, it's still new in the CRR community. I think Greg Rogers would probably tell you that from IAFC Fire and Life Safety Section as well too. At their conference, there hasn't been a significant movie component to that quite yet. Um, a presentation here, a presentation there, but I think it's coming. So I think it's a missed opportunity if we don't get. Well, how, how could it not be part of your component if your community itself has a has a. But it's but it's also if if it hasn't gotten there yet, who's getting it there? 
is anyone focusing on getting it there? And those, the, and those groups are, I know, okay. fire and life safety section. So there's people kind of that are discussion. focused on it, it just hasn't been. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, when you say focused on it, I don't know that it's been um, like, here is your task and focus on it, but they know it's out there. It's a topic um, that's in discussion. It's gained some, some traction, but it needs further help. Sure. And if it needs help from in the form of it can use us. work, right? And is we're here. So you know, what does that? If, if it's something, yeah, we wish we would, could do it, but we just don't have the time. Or people, or I, I just it just hasn't become part of the conversation yet. It's been so focused on home cooking fires, reducing um, you know fire deaths and in, in residences, um, public housing, those kinds of things. Those have been. The traditional areas where it's been is just now coming into the conversation. That's why I asked a dumb question. <laughs> question is dumb. Um, yeah, so that's that's something that we should be aware of. One thing, Kelly's age has come out because CCR is free to clear water. <laughs> straight in another conversation, that would be true. <laughs> um, but. You know, the, the thing that uh, bothers some to local agencies are our federal partners. And I know when I was a battalion chief responding um, into the forest, we had to carry two radios, one for our 800 megahertz and one to talk to the feds because they do not interact. Technology has helped with that in that you can get it now with both VHF and 800 in a single radio. But the locals are bearing that expense from not paying for two radios for to get one. So there again, we in the codes demand that we can communicate inside buildings and we put in the structure into the building so that, that communication works. But yet they're uh, lag behind and we rely on the to figure that out on that communication piece. So there are a lot of sub levels to just getting the WUI code that would be helpful. We lost a firefighter in California because of a miscommunication location of where they were standing and they did. Airplane did one of their big dumps and it ripped through the trees and unfortunately one of the town chiefs away from our state and there again, it was no communication with the federal resource in the air to the ground crews, and they had this drop should have been. So. I, I would suggest that one of the places we could take it up to, and I don't see him on the call today, but typically Gary McCarraher is on the call from uh, AT&T FirstNet, um, and he might be a good one to just get that conversation started. It's yeah. just making sure that our scope is broad and that all partners, we all want to be partners, we all want to Sometimes I, I realize the cost to the federal is extreme because of federal partners being able to. And I just, I don't think it's a lot of Well, I think part of it also is. For certain states, you know, we say, well, some states that that may have wildfires and they they don't adopt it. What is the reason? I, I don't think it, it is. They don't think it. They don't think that their area is at risk. It is. Hey, this is now. If it's a statewide or uh, enforcement, then it is putting that responsibility for funding and personnel and enforcement um, onto a local jurisdiction, um, and. Because I'm trying to think, what would be the pushback to that, right? No, but that's that, that's that you, what you speak is true because is that it, the other it's, all, it's like the, the you know you get the question and the answer is going to be it depends. So am I a jurisdiction that that also encompasses federal land? That puts me in a category, or do I now only just encompass state land that I have a responsibility for fire district? And or do none of those apply? But I'm out in the woods by myself. And, and this is all our local community money, and and I don't I don't have those other other pieces. 
So each one of those deserves its own consideration and has its own circumstances addressed by work. And so we can do that. But in, in so doing that, as you drill down into the belief, things like radio communications can be a problem or not be a problem. It may just be a mutual aid issue. Now it's, it's a mutual aid, you know, uh, department to department, which pretty much AT&T will take care of from that perspective. Take care of it on a national basis for federal partners, state partners, the local jurisdiction. That has to be worked out if those those pieces are there for us and that's it. So <clears throat> there's no easy answer. And each one is gonna have to be engineered fit the pieces. Well, and I think that that we as those promoting, we need to recognize that what some of the pushback reasons are because they're valid. Staffing is valid. Uh, ability, well, you're giving me this mandate to enforce, but I don't have the personnel to, to be able to, to, or the scope in my jurisdiction to be able to to enforce it. So we have to see that other side, at least be cognizant of it as we're you know, yeah. but we have to look at. You show up on scene with one guy on the engine, Couple volunteers show up, and you still got two in, two out to deal with, and everything else goes on for that little department. Now we also got to do. It. How do you do that safety? How do you do that? Questions. Well, I'm glad to hear that there's there's more. Thank you, Carl, for showing that spreadsheet. So I'm I'm glad to see that across the country there's more that. Than I thought there was, um, personally, but but I, I think that this is something that continued conversations that we can have. What does it mean as FSMC? Where do we go? Who do we talk to? If it's people with you know that we can show our interest in, in assisting you know those for CRR or through NASM or you know how do we get how do how do we show that we're here that that we have it as an interest or a priority. Can I can I make a potential suggestion? Sure. So the issue is as we know large, wide ranging, complex. It would be appropriate for the Forest Service membership committee to establish a fit to deal with buoy and, and what it implies. And how can the FSMC be a part of that in other conversations? Working with ICC and our other partners um, to one demonstrate seriousness of the subject, but secondly, then provide information to like our committee that does the, the, the public, either the public education or the public uh, awareness, and feed that to those groups without public awareness having to go down the Woodburn Road by itself. <laughs> Consideration. Now, it would be also a good place for us to be able to join with another board within the IAFC as well, too, yes. which is the Wildland Fire Policy Committee, which I'm uh, pretty close with. And uh, Rich Hall is currently the he's out of Kittitas uh, County, um, Washington, or Kittitas, I guess is the way you pronounce yeah, it Kittitas. appropriately. But yes, yeah, so he is uh, he's the current chair. He, he replaced Eric Litzenberg, who um, was the uh, the chair there for a long time. They've got some really smart folks and they'd be a great group, just like the FLSS, the Fire and Life Safety Section to, to join up with and to help push that message a little bit too. How do people feel about that? Remember that our work groups need- Yeah, that's what I would say. I agree with it, but I'm, I'm worried that that we're having a hard time getting people on the four groups that we have now um, to be. Gene. Well, let's let's continue thinking about it and see if it is how maybe whether it's people to to join, even though you know. Um, See where we can go with it and see what kind of avenues they want to fit in so we don't overtask. Yeah, can we put it on the agenda for next month? Yeah, think about it and then um, let's come back together and, and 
see where we may want. Again, some of us probably have a little more interest in it. State 63 3rd of our state lands controlled by the um, roadblock we see, and I know it's kind of similar to what Kelly mentioned. Colorado. Um, we have adopted statewide but it's the 2006 version. Tried pushing this several times, but currently, well, the last 10 years, the Senate president, our House speaker, our majority whip are all home builders. They feel mm -hmm. like anything in the WUI, so they're tolerant of the 2006, but every time we bring it up, it gets uh, this kind of problem. So even though it is statewide adopted, trying to get a new they felt like it would impact their bottom line personally. So struggled to get that on the docket. So there we all deal with different roadblocks and, right. and there are many within each state that make them trouble. Well then I think that that is another example of agenda is perhaps a too wide certain states are getting are getting it if it's not statewide how do we get it to our, our state fire service agencies that whether it have to be let's start out small you know instead of going statewide is it something more regional or local that at least to get started for those that that want to be able to do it and if that's the case how do we get that information Any other comments on that item? I think this is a good spot to um, take a five, 10 minute break. Circulating. Sorry, for those of you on the on virtually, uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Um, so we will get back um, at, Eleven fifteen. Um, what's well it's eleven thirteen now. Eleven thirteen, so eleven twenty-five. Yep. Thank you, everyone. We'll be back between eleven twenty and eleven twenty-five. See you there, Chief West. Hey, I, sh I shot you a text message there too, Gary. If you could just um, reply back to me or email me at some point with that too, that'd be great. Thanks, man. We'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to leave the mic hot here. I went back to the staff room to see if there's an extension cord. I was starting to get the low bat load. Yeah. I came in here with like 50 percent. Does it, they don't have power drop over there for you? There are no cords over there, but I see this. This might give me enough. There it is. I do need a little. I had nothing in the staff room. Usually, sometimes there's a box. Yep. You know, you can go scan. Yeah. There's one. You can scan a cord for That's with the podium. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got to do what you're doing at the region meeting, but I'm like, the iPad's only got one. It's either going to be AV or power, right? Stanabel's here. He'll be able to help me with it too. If we need it. I need juice. Um, how long's the break for? I came well for ten minutes. Twenty five. Oh, they were having a round round round. Oh, where did they get? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, 
thì cái nhà họ trao vấn đề của Đức Chúa Trời 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 How you doing, Kelly? Hey, Mike. How are you, sir? Doing well. Drive back was fun yesterday. Went all the way down 22A, and then uh, we kind of crossed uh, down down by Lake George. Oh, it's not. That's pretty, huh? Yeah, I'll tell you what, it was all country road, but it was very, very nice, very pretty. What time did you get down there? Not about five. That's we not bad. Left, yeah, we left about seven in the morning. Yeah. The only bad part was the, uh, the uh, dog place going out of town once the open by, so we had to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we took Brian and Kelly out yesterday and went to like six covered bridges. Yeah. About it. Did they head back? They'll be heading out tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. It was fun seeing you up here. You too. You too. Mike, did you hear me getting after Carl about uh, yes. saying Nevada? I said you sound like a flatlander from Vermont. Yeah. It was good to see you last week. We had a great time up there. It was really fun. Did you go? Are you going to buy a Prius? <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, I looked for blue stickers on every one I passed. <laughs> you know, the yeah. funny part is every time they talk about, <laughs> they do some joke about people from California. They'll say something like, two Californians got in a car wreck, and before the state patrol got there, they got out of their Priuses, they uh, talked a little bit about environmental uh, sustainability and got all that taken care of before police got on the scene. So that's kind of the craziness we deal with sometimes. I hear you. Michael, whip off a moose joke there. What's that? I said whip off a, a moose joke, something about a moose. Something about Rocky and Bullwinkle would be good. Yeah. Hey, we miss I'm not... you. Two. We miss you two down here today. Huh? Yeah. Hey, I would have done it, but it didn't really make sense with uh, just travel and costs and things like that. I think somebody at ICC is going to say thank you for us not coming later on. Yeah, the bookkeeper. <laughs> I did see a moose at the airport, though, Michael. Oh, good. Yeah, it's stuffed. I'll send you a picture of it. That was a nice ride you took, right? Down through the... That was a great ride. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that was much, much better than just riding interstate the whole way. It was all, a lot of back roads, and the colors were so beautiful over there. And yeah. they're not in full color. It's all green, and then there's like spots here and there, and that's what made it so beautiful. Yeah. So some canyon up there too that I stopped at was was really nice. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a pass you get through. 
It was the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah, it's the Grand. Uh, I think it's in New Hampshire, though. Maybe the Grand New Hampshire Canyon. I've been thinking about it. And I was... Yeah. But it was a pleasant ride home. Yeah. My, my whole trip home was pleasant. It was just long. Yeah. Hey, Coy, is Tim Deal to your uh, right? Uh, he, he was sitting across on the other side. Yeah, I'm here, Mike. Where are you? Come in. Tim, Tim's phone was, or Tim's camera was on too, which yeah. gave a good view of the room. I, you can see both sides of the room. Yes. Tim's here That's now. Nice. Mike. I'll have to get closer to the oh, no. What do you need, Mike? I just want to say hi to you. <laughs> I'm missing you, Mike, man. I was hoping you'd be able to come. So. <laughs> hey, Tim. Hey, Gary. How are you? Doing good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm bouncing back and forth between building and here. So. Thank you for sharing your camera too. It gives a good view of the ring. And get started. Um, it after <laughs> right after we broke, I realized, oh shoot, we only have until noon, and it, it always seems this time goes by so quickly, and we always have great discussions that that um, you know, we have a half an hour left. Um, but before we get back into the agenda, I see Director Brown. Uh, we entered the room. I wanted to open the floor if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Cole. Certainly wish you Questions?
Um, one quick um, last note on the um, A um, was the code amendment proposals to FCAC. So uh, there's nothing that is um, stopping FSMC to discussing and providing input or information or um, communication to FCAC regarding any code amendments or proposals. I know that some of the things that we're working with through Michael's group for emerging issues and trends uh, ended up being on FCAC's um, discussion. And I know, you know, Kelly, you've kind of been our, one of our connectors to FCAC. Um, so something to keep in mind that as we progress, again, going into our participation within the national uh, development process, what are we finding out that might be of interest or if things like I know some things were coming out through um, whether it was inflatable spray boots and, and there's been some changes with um, that just happened like ERCs, which now it's different, but um, those systems. So what does that, um, th but they were driven kind of discussed about through FCAC. So um, just keep in mind, especially uh, for Michael's group, where we are, what we're discussing here might pay, pay, dive into that. And, and, you know, if moving forward, if we need to have that, maintain that link, let's just keep in mind that we can, we can, that's part of our participation is being able to communicate with FCAC and, and work both ways with what our focus is as well. Totally agree. So. Um, okay, so 6B, um, so obviously we've seen um, some uh, some disasters that have happened um, over the past year, um, the Texas freeze and uh, the Surfside Florida building collapse. And so I just wanted to bring up for discussion that how can FSMC be uh, either included or what's our role in when these um, events happen, um, what what can we do to either help in, to help in um, moving forward and the recovery of, of such or um, promotion, prevention? Um, what, does, what does that kind of look for people and their, your thoughts on when something happens in the localized area that that we see could be a fire service issue, um, what do you think our role is uh, or should be? Or you don't think there needs to be a role? What I, I'm looking for some feedback. I know um, after everything that just came through. Fire monitor getting a few investigator, fire investigator, fire inspectors to do it, but never followed the other fire inspector side of it. Um, I think it has to respond and go to the area to help with the local fire inspections or something after the doctor try to get the business. So that it, it goes, so the request came from to the state. So, yeah, the request came from Louisiana to the state, which my jurisdiction in Annapolis City, Florida uh, County, that they had personnel available, but we never heard anything. So what is that communication? look like to be able to just so you're saying provide have more local provide assistance yeah. to so you have like the national FEMA teams and stuff that respond right. for that but also on the other side other than eliminating the immediate uh, person response there's a lot of trying to get the businesses back up helping them with sites of inspection and stuff so it seems like there, there's a role within disaster management and what does that look like to better that realm? Um, but then they even cite uh, how do you how do you ensure gas is coming back on? 
big focus is residential. So what does that look like in our entire help um, increase that ability to recover? Carl, I was say something. I, I was just going to say that I, I thought ICC, we have a response team, right? I was letting that conversation go yeah. first. I think yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I I can uh, I can bring yeah. that in a in a couple minutes. If yeah. That's all right. I know Tara had a question too. I, I was asking like what role are some members of the community in helping with that recovery? We do branch out with all our divisions, IAMC throughout the country. Just getting those names to the people in that area that something happened in our, you know, in our area of the Missouri Valley. At least I could maybe push out to the neighboring states that what, what the need is for, for that area that might have a disaster. Because it sounds like they, they do need help, obviously. You know, they can't do it all on their own. They're doing it to themselves, but we branch out throughout the whole United States. And so maybe just getting those names to the people who need the help um, and fire service council decisions to figure out how to do that. And so, and just providing that assistance so they don't have to go looking for it. Um, That's my idea. Thing to throw this into this is because we have earthquake potential, transportation, all the response team that would be inspection, building official, structural engineer, just to clear building. Just to say this is safe to go in and get the minimum amount of things or can go back in the building with structural intervention support. I thought the biggest drawback to that was common credentialing. I'm not going to accept his because I don't know if his is as good as hers and this and that and back and forth. And every time we've tried to put that together, common credentialing roadblock mm -hmm. or acceptance. So we Really nice if we could have something that be recognized. So I know if ICC comes out with their inspections or board inspections, for us we know what that's about. But others in our community, structural engineers and some of those don't, and then they don't know what your is as good as what I have. It seems like a silly thing to have in reality something to where people show up and this is what I do recognize it. we've had to do that the Olympics in 2002 we had to say all right for the period of these 17 days if you're a paramedic in Colorado or Arizona or whatever we'll let you be a paramedic and do these things in Utah to help us out but that took an act from the legislature to do that Shouldn't be so what I've got up on the screen for those online and, and here in the room is the ICC and CSEA Disaster Response Align, uh, Alliance. So it's disasterresponse.org, it's International Code Council and National Council of Structural Engineers Associations. Uh, this group is about uh, 1,500 names or so that we've got in a database that we manage, that uh, we share with local jurisdictions all the way up to federal interagency partners when requested, um, that are capable of doing post-disaster building safety assessments and habitability assessments. Um, any of the other things that we've talked about here in the room this morning are also uh, kind of on the table, I guess, in terms of adding capability um, if needed. Uh, we've been working with uh, FEMA to talk to them a little bit about um, recognizing this group as a little bit more of an asset, but we have work to do to be able to get there before they're kind of a mission ready uh, capability. And to that end, um, one of the things that we need to do is um, there are 
now six different resource type definitions for folks that do that type of work, whether they be inspectors, there's one for architects, um, there's one for team leaders, uh, coordinators, that kind of thing. So there's six different um, uh, resource typing definitions that the Code Council participated in developing with our partners at FEMA and um, AIA and ASCE and other places like that. Um, and we've got to be able to get these resource types in, get mission ready packages together under EMAC, um, and then uh, have some of the folks that are under here, particularly some of the, the state teams that are already organized and well known, like California, um, the SAP um, Structural Assessment Program. Uh, there are probably a handful of others I know of, four or five others WASAFE, Washington SAFE in the state of Washington, and, and uh, I know Missouri SAVES is another one, Missouri, Co Missouri SAVES Coalition. Um, and to just get them recognized as deployable assets. Um, right now, functionally speaking, in the real world, the way that this group works is we do promote it through our membership and through NCSEA, particularly during times of disaster, we drive the, the message to join. Um, we also will produce ad hoc lists uh, on request. And typically what we see is um, uh, local jurisdictions, not at the, necessarily at the state level, but local jurisdictions kind of reaching out saying, hey, we need the help. And uh, they essentially can kind of go local to local uh, where they can, a lot of the people that are on this list are uh, already government employees. To your point, Coy, they're, they're vetted uh, because they're coming with credentials from another um, entity, another government entity right off the bat. And they just do a local agreement um, for reimbursement or whatever it's gonna be that uh, they do. But I think there's a lot of potential here um, I think that particularly if there's more interest in it, we could always use the help. And I think uh, another little investment of some either staff or member or combination of both time and resources to kind of build this up a little bit would, um, this is a really great concept. It's just no one organization can kind of take it on, right? So uh, we've got to build up that, that uh, collective uh, management group so to speak, add the right people, and then uh, within that, kind of get the resources out of Hyde to be able to um, build this into what it can be. But I can tell you FEMA and the National Response Coordination Center um, and response ops there, particularly um, some of the recovery directorate folks are very interested in this because they spend, uh, my former life, I came from a, a architectural and engineering firm as a non-A&E guy, um, doing FEMA work, doing PA and IA work, and um, response work and that kind of thing. And um, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on organizations like ours every year to go out, and my former employer at Dewberry, to go out and do substantial damage estimates and habitability assessments in the field for their program related work. And, you know, it will, I don't think that that will ever be eliminated, but they sure could use this kind of a network um, that is trusted well-educated, uh, well-versed in being able to do this kind of work to be able to put into the field and not have that be, you know, essentially another item on the federal agenda of things to take care of during a disaster. So. I have seen this work in, in Texas on uh, occasions from flooding, tornado. See the measures come out over the, the Texas uh, chapter. Say they're looking for XXXX who can go to here. Basically, from, from there, they get the permission from their, and they're off and running. Down there for a day, they may be down there for, depending on what the business have. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they also go out of state. Some of the stuff they just got okay. this last few weeks. Um, well, I've, I've seen it work, and, and it's got great volumes. Okay. Something that can be fleshed out. And or am I helping you? Most of the stuff we do on the side of the is just helping. It, it is a similar org in Texas, too, that uh, one of the ICC members, Jim Olk, who I don't know if you had the chance to meet at all, so he's the building official in Garland. He heads the uh, Building Officials Association of Texas disaster response team there similarly. So fire marshals are doing that, Jim's doing that, and has been leading that 
effort with um, boat right. for a number of years, and they've been doing deployments into Texas, I mean, into Louisiana uh, on a number of occasions. So, and they get, they're statewide. So, um, it, just another connection point there with, you know, North Texas and, and all the rest of that. So. I just pulled this up, was looking at 47 areas you could. Yep. Yep. So yeah. It's probably one of the best kept secrets in ICD. Yep. That's why I brought it up when we were talking about it. So we'll, we'll put this link in a minute so that uh, everyone can. <clears throat> and this could be something that. You know, Talk about with our updating of our web page. Can we put that link on our web page to the top? And then the other thing that I'll show you in here, these are the the resource typing position qualifications. So you've got resource typing definition for a post disaster building safety evaluation team in here, and then all these individual position qualifications for a strike team leader, strike team technical supervisor. Building safety evaluator, which is essentially that core uh, mission of the uh, of the DRA, um, and then you've got, as I said, on the architectural side, um, AIA's got a group, and we've been uh, asking them if they want to come along with what we're doing. I know Rachel Minery just left AIA, so I don't know who her replacement is there, but we're going to try to bring them in. Um, and then you've got this structural condition uh, evaluator, which is really just you know kind of like your senior structural structural SME. So these are all really great. They're in there and that's kind of the expectation level for for quals. Um, this is this is a um, so in another life that I live kind of deal with some retirement things. Say one of the higher in the system we have more responsibilities. Let's say you're a director or this is don't always maintain your certifications because you're not doing the work day to day anymore. You're just teaching it, and and so and you're not gonna do what you do. But this is a great reason to maintain your certification years so that you have more time and you are retired. They can tap you. You can go unfettered to go assist. As, as a community service I chose to versus, oh, I'm done and then everything fall off. Maintain the good practices. So there's, a, there's an offset I'm seeing here as an opportunity for people um, educated, stay educated, research, and know that there's a, a place for you. Once you've retired, maintain your membership with with your ICC chapter as a, as a for emeritus or by whatever methodology they have and then these um, two events happen you're able to go out and assist um, that's what I would think this um, this opportunity that we don't promote um, it, it is you have to be a, a current you know 20 something uh, in the office young gun type of guy who's a girl one of the things that we're working on, Kelly, is and one of the big challenges for this, just so that it's not all kind of this big, you know, kind of seeming seemingly like bed of roses, so to speak. It's a, it's a hidden gem, as you said. Um, but one of the challenges that we try to overcome is exactly what you're talking about, which is folks who have now transitioned out of government into the private sector or retired, and um, how to have them recognized within EMAC. Um, because of the fact that only about 15 states recognize that private sector uh, kind of assistance right now, the uh, remainder of the states are really focused on government to government level EMAC missions. And um, FEMA has done a really super job. They have a layout state by state now on their site as to EMAC uh, requirements, IMAC, also interstate mutual aid assistance um, statutes and policy every state and territory in the country. So it's a phenomenal resource to be able to go out there and take a look at what the current state of play is for that kind of work and deployments. But 
Um, still, the, the big effort is trying to find the folks like even, you know, Steve is still in industry, um, just transitioned out of government. You know, try to take a guy like him with the knowledge and the background that he's got and get him deployed as a contractor today, even though FEMA spends hundreds of millions of dollars on that kind of work uh, on a regular basis, trying to get that recognized under EMAC because of the way that the statutes are written in the states is almost near impossible for those, what, 35 um, states that are that are not currently wired for private sector. So we're working through uh, the National Emergency Management Association, the state directors of emergency management, and the International Association of Emergency Managers to address that at state by state. But as you know, those things take time, and um, it's a heck of a resource that's just not available. So you know, in the end, the way that it works to get you know, using Steve's example, um, the government to government, you know, it comes down to being Kelly. You're the you're the building official in you know, somewhere in California, if you, you know, you want to take Steve and, and bring him in and essentially, you know, get that cleared within your state government to be able to do it. That's, that's up to you, but there's not a formal mechanism to move him through EMAC or IMAC right now. So something to think about, or even uh, what's the, what's California's system um, for moving resources. It's a, uh, um, not SEMS, um, there's another, another name for it too. I think it's like an M, I think. Yeah, but just getting those people, I mean, you got to be, you got to be this, you got to check that box now, you know, it's just like, you know, forestry of, of, of the old days with the red card, you know, it's the same, same here to be able to get deployed. So. I was just going to throw out, you know, I, I play in this world too. My perspective of that and, you know, talking about how the fire service can be involved, this, this is very building official architect engineer focus but i i don't know if it has to be and maybe that's something that doesn't this program can work on you know especially if you went through the fire service and the usar program it's pretty darn good to look at buildings that way too and i i raised my hand on that right off the bat because i did the, the same thing and yeah. yeah. who are you going to go to texas in the freeze and fire protection systems are frozen and they got to go back in service who's going to help with that where the primary candidates be handling that type mm -hmm. of situation and working on that thing. Well, that was my, my other thought. That training is a lot about building stuff, um, but they don't get into some of the other things that fire department's good at. You know, one example is hazmat. You might send these assessment crews into a disaster area and they're not looking for hazardous materials. Danger themselves. That's something. How many floating propane tanks are there out there? How many fuel you systems know. are 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 now thinking for the bubble? Their their eyes aren't trained to look for that, and ours are. The fire side. Where it's a place where a fire inspector is a valuable member of that assessment team. They're looking at the structural safety stuff. We're looking for the hazardous stuff. Well, it might be because I haven't been on this website, but <clears throat> perhaps some some um, investigation <laughs> on this website to see what are the positions that fire could be included on, what are the qualifications that are needed, and how can we get training in order for people to get those qualifications. And if there aren't many positions, is there a way that we can add positions? With certain qualifications that would benefit that to, to fill a gap that we might right. see. Ones that are and I think one of the largest things that we've seen and I've seen in my emergency management side of my career has been this need for surge resources wherever you go, whether that be building officials, whether it be fire marshals, whatever somebody's office is decimated. And of course, unless you're super well resourced, like, you know, many of us in the national capital region are super well resourced and are three deep and many of those positions that can field state and international teams. Um, in the end, most of the country is not that way, as we all know. And um, just being able to reach out and staff a fire marshal's office um, and provide inspectors and plan reviewers and folks that, you know, right? And I mean, that's if you're doing, you know, you're expanding your hours, people are working 12s, um, you know, trying to get in there and, and expand that bench out to be three or even four deep um, for the first, you know, three or four months of a disaster. I mean, you can deploy somebody out for two weeks and make a difference like that. 
um, or even a month. Um, you know, I've done those and that's a, that's a pretty big deal and it moves the needle for the locality or the state um, that you're going to, whether you're in the EOC or in the field. So I think there's plenty of opportunity, I guess, is where that was, was headed. It's just a matter of kind of how you uh, pitch it and then how we wire it in the system um, to, to do that. So. Okay, um, 6C, uh, the work group goals uh, for this next year. So if um, all of the work groups can please start thinking about your goals for 2022. Um, anything that you need to finish for 2021 or need to carry over to 2022 or trying to get status, um, you know, we have these goals, we give them to Carl. Um, what an end of year report? Yeah, I'll have to do a report to the board of directors for their December board meeting. So if you could plan on um, getting some of that information in based on achievements and meetings and progress this year, and then maybe what we're looking, you know, some forward looking uh, aspects of what we're looking at into next year, but not too deep, just a, a glimpse of what next year holds for particularly the new officers on the board. Um, that would be much appreciated. And we uh, we typically report that out in December at their board meeting. I don't know where it's going to be, how that happens. Uh, I know Chief West has, uh, he, he and Chief Metz last year addressed the board, or no, two years ago, directly at the annual conference in Las Vegas. And I will continue to look for those opportunities, but I believe the December board meeting um, will not be open to, uh, to kind of some of that outside participation as it has been. So when we return to that, I'll make sure that Christine and, and others and, and Randy, of course, um, and, you know, whoever else may follow in your shoes too, um, are teed up for that kind of visibility with the board. That's always appreciated. Uh, so, 1 thing to, to think about as well, I mean, we, we kind of hit it a, a couple of different ways. Um, is the uh, reminder that the FSMC, the governing committee, a work. And um, hence the reason why we have four work groups, but we call them work groups for a reason. It's because we do work and provide great product out of each work group. So we have some um, new uh, committee members that I would encourage if they are not uh, aligned with the, our work group is to uh, go to some of the work group um, meetings, um, see what works for you. Um, all work groups are um, accepting, encouraging participation, not only from um, governing uh, committee members, but any member of the public who wishes to participate. Um, our main uh, FSMC meeting is third Thursday, 10 Eastern, and then each work group meets individually. Um, I think, Mark, you said. Mark, yours is when? What? First, first Wednesday of each month. First Wednesday of each month. Public awareness is second Thursday of each month. Thursday morning uh, at 1030. Uh, Michael, when is your um, monthly meeting? It's scattered month to month right now, but my hope would be that at some point here, we can get onto a predetermined schedule, but uh, that hasn't worked out yet. Okay, and then Gary, um, what about membership? We have a monthly meeting and I go to it. It just pops up on my calendar. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. For Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Hold on, I'll tell you when that is. <laughs> Let me see every month and it just pops calendar. up. And speaking of what, Carl is, is putting that up for uh, everyone in, in the uh, is if you're interested in receiving emails of any of these meetings um, or information, please send your contact information to Carl uh, K. Pippinger at ICCSafe.org. Uh, let them know that you're interested in participating in the FSMC, either general meeting or if you're interested in work groups and so forth. We'd love to have you participate and listen in. Uh, 
be able to get um, great information. This is a great networking tool as well. So, um, so I just go back to oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Did you get pull up? That? Yeah. So the membership working group call is fourth Thursday of the month um, from one thirty to two Eastern. So. Uh, it's a half hour. It's a lightning round. I can tell you, Gary and I and Andy King have a lot of fun on that call. Um, and we actually have come up with some really great ideas. And the fact that we do it as a half hour call puts us under that that kind of pressure to get things done. So it works out well. So one thing. To yeah, we welcome anyone to participate. Please. Absolutely. On any work group. You guys are not going to believe who just entered the room. <laughs> Please, 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 please. And hold on, I'll turn the. Here, hold on. Randy Metz, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. I'm gonna leave. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so one thing that um, that we wanted to bring up was an opportunity that um, in an, an ability or an, uh, an effort to provide succession training for chair positions of FSMC is um, we have uh, we have a, um, what do you call it? I was gonna say shadow, but that's not right. Um, a mentor. A mentor that, or a mentee, I guess, that. Um, if, mentor protege. Yeah, okay. if, if anyone would, is interested in learning um, and being able to participate on the governing committee that <clears throat> that is interested in um, seeing what it's like to be in a vice chair or chair position um, to attend the weekly meetings to kind of see the a little bit of the other side of it. Um, I was able to take advantage of that opportunity, um, and that really helped me um, in my role of, of vice chair now. So. If you have an interest in uh, being involved in that way, um, please see Randy or I or Carl um, to uh, let us know if you're interested in that. Um, you know, things the way that they may happen may change as of tomorrow um, with the the chair positions in FSMC. So, um, and if that happens, then we want to be able to to have some. Preparation um, and not just throw somebody into it. Um, I'm a firm believer that you know people don't volunteer when they don't know what they're volunteering for. So, so if it is something that that you're interested and want to learn a little bit more about it, please see Randy or I. Um, we can let you know kind of what goes on. Um, love to have you be a part of that um, next chapter um, for us to continue with the leadership of FSMC. So, Kelly. So this was kind of a, a supporting thought to that um, what first came on. Probably for the first year. Didn't know smart. But who smart was. I would say it's probably would not be a bad idea since this is a relatively small committee. Talk about the governing committee itself, not necessarily the whole fire service membership committee. Talk about so, that when somebody new comes on board, we assign somebody to be their point of contact, or whatever you want to call it, that can give them insight, answer questions, and sit down and meet another one. This is what we're all about. That way, everybody gets onboarded, not just to work with me. That's nice. But we lose, we're losing opportunity with people because it's taken, it takes them a while. And I don't know, I might totally forget this. But when you go from a new person to active participant, um, so that we can uh, use their talents uh, as, as part, of the, part of the committee, might be worth looking at. Great point. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, we, we've all been there, right? When we first come in, it's, it's like, okay, who, who, who does what and, and how do things run? So it, it would certainly put people at ease, I think, a lot quicker.
Um, before we um, go a little bit further, I, I think that's Director Tom in the back. <laughs> um, just trying to see. I want to um, give um, Director Tom a minute if you would just not put you on the spot, but I will. Um, if you want to just say um, a couple of words since um, you had just come in. Sure, thanks for putting me on the spot. I, I think most of you know me by now. I'm Stuart Tom, um, running for the Secretary of Treasury seat. I uh, just wanted to make sure I stopped by here because uh, out of all the membership council, this one is my heart. So thank you for all. Thank you very much. Um, so the um, so the next one was um, future FSMC efforts and want to open that up to all of you as to where do you feel that um, we need to be? Uh, where are we going? Um, what is working? What's not working? Um, for all of the committee's input to um, anything that you want to bring up with regard to FSMC efforts. Mm -hmm. One of the things we could probably do with this, Christine, is to talk about this one and maybe the next that one, one is same time. agenda items for next for the October oh, meeting. Sure. And the only reason why I say that is I logistically have got to run here. And I have a meeting yeah. with FEMA leadership that's here. Okay. Uh, that I'm a few minutes late for. So okay. it, would it be okay if we um, push those and table those for um, the October agenda okay. and tee those up under new business? Absolutely. Would that be okay? Absolutely. What time is it? It's a few minutes after 12, 12 or 7. So. Um, okay, so we will, um, for those of you who didn't quite hear, um, we're going to table 6D and E. Um, so I'm just queuing it up then for the next meeting. Um, please have an idea, any ideas that you might want to bring forward. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, October 21st at 1.30 Eastern. Um, so you should get, if you haven't already, you'll get a, a meeting request for that. Um, any uh, other final comments, questions from either the committee or um, the audience? Kelly, I, I was thinking that the um, the FSRI video that the introductory one where they you know did the the, the change that Steve showed up in uh, Vermont right. would maybe be a good one to put in front of the group if you so chose to do that next month if you wanted to. But maybe you can it's a, and it's on their website too. Yeah. So. Well, we didn't, you don't need that. No, but I. You just download it. Yep. And by the time to show it. I I will. I didn't want to get out in front of you on that because you'd be you're well equipped to speak to it. So. We're good. You know, Randy, I just I don't want to leave the meeting as you're. Like to say. You know, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, all of your work that you've done throughout the entire year. Um, it makes my job, Christine's job, Carl's job much more enjoyable and easier. Um, special thank you to Christine for chairing this meeting for me today. My apologies on not being able to be here, but uh, I don't control the schedule. But uh, it sounds like you guys had a great productive meeting. And I'll catch up with Carl and Christine on what was discussed. And we want to thank you all for joining us online or being here in person. Uh, we really need to get back to doing this uh, twice a year uh, because we lose a lot of the, the networking and inter interactivity uh, trying to do this all online. So um, I always look forward to being here in person with you all, and I'm glad that we're able to be able to do that again. So thank you. If there's no other final comments, thank you again. I'll echo Randy's statement. Thank you for being here. It's great to see people's um, faces in person. Um, the rest of the conference, um, remember that the annual business meeting, 8.30, start tomorrow morning. Um, other than that, stay safe, and we'll chat soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Great job, Chris. Thanks, yep. Gary. <laughs> see you guys. Good seeing everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody that's online for your patience too. I know it wasn't optimal in terms of the audio, but it was great to see you all and thanks for participating to all of you. Rick, best of health to you and your family. Robbie, great to see you. I, I had a good chat with Ray while we were in Vermont. So Robbie, you and I have a couple things to talk about relative to Florida and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Carl. Right, yeah, be safe. Of course, okay. see you later. Bye-bye.